Today we're bringing you a special International Women's Day roundtable about a significant national blind spot. It's well known that in Australia's deadly domestic violence epidemic, on average one woman a week is murdered and that one in six females over the age of 15 has experienced abuse by a partner or former partner. But there's far less said about a group of Australian women who cop a disproportionate level of that violence. I'm talking about Indigenous women. They experience domestic violence three times the rate of the average population and their hospitalisation rates due to family violence are a whopping 32 times, 32 times higher than non-Indigenous women. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women are 10 times more likely to die from violent assault. So why is this a blind spot and what needs to happen to tackle domestic violence within our Indigenous communities? Our panellists for this morning's roundtable have put a lot of thought into this. Let me introduce them. Linda Burney is the Shadow Minister for Indigenous Australians and a member of the Wiradjuri Nation. And Dr Hannah McGlade is a human rights lawyer, senior Indigenous research fellow at Curtin University in WA and a Noongar woman. Welcome both of you to Sunday Extra. Good morning, Kathy. Hi, Hi, Hannah. Hello, Linda. Hannah, could I begin with you? You wrote an opinion piece late last year lamenting that Australia is turning a blind eye to violence against Indigenous women. Can you explain why you believe that? I guess in um, since my, oh, going on three decades of work in this area, um, seeing so little response, knowing the critical seriousness of the issue, the fact that women are uh, um, women's lives are at risk, uh, and everything, um, any responses that we get are, are so far, you know, too too little, too little, too late. Um, that uh, you know, it seems like there is um, you know a blind spot, and in that case, I was looking at an Aboriginal lady who had experienced um, twenty years of very severe violence uh, with use of weapons, with her life being threatened and at risk. And ultimately she did fight back and she got a a murder sentence of 12 years. Um, And I was campaigning for her early release because it was an unjust sentence. So, you know, from everything that I have seen, the constant fight and struggle to get our governments um, and community to take this seriously, you know, I do, I do believe that was an, a fairly accurate assessment. And Hannah, what is it? Do you think is behind this reluctance to acknowledge what is the true extent of Indigenous domestic and family violence? Well, is it about um, inequality that still exists in Australia? That some lives don't matter, and and since frontier colonisation. Indigenous women uh, bore the brunt of a very violent colonial um, interface. Uh, There was a recent film, Nightingale, I believe, where members of the audience walked out. They thought it was too violent. You know, I think perhaps people don't want to see or know enough about the truth of our history. There's a fantastic book called Skin Deep, written by historian Liz Connors, which talks about um, all the pictorial representations of Indigenous women over um, over a century, and they are horrific, you know. So I think racism and violence. These are very ugly topics here. And um, And uncomfortable topics. Uncomfortable topics. And we don't like to think about them. We're not directing attention to it. We don't want to look at the case of murdered and missing Indigenous women. We don't want to know about the orphans and the children that are left behind and the suffering that's ongoing in the community as a result. Linda Burney, you've said, and I quote, people need to recognise that for Aboriginal families, these are not statistics. They're real people. They're sisters, mothers, cousins, aunties. Why did you feel you had to make that point, that that, that need to humanise this issue? I felt very strongly that that point need, needed to be made uh, because we are talking about real people. I mean, the question, Cathy, that you've presented to Hannah and I is is why why don't we talk about this? And I think statistics wash over people and we know the statistics that you've quoted this morning. So we need to hear real stories uh, about real people and what the effect is. I mean, there is there is a good understanding now about violence uh, within the Aboriginal community and uh, there are some very real ways in which it can be addressed, but it's going to require uh, listening to Aboriginal people, uh, making sure that there's not a gendered lens uh, put on this, 
can understand that the historical context that Hannah's talked about, the threat of child removal, uh, the, the, the threat of incarceration are very real things within the Aboriginal community and women think about them deeply. You called for a Senate inquiry late last year with the aim of better understanding the extent of violence against Indigenous women right across Australia. I mean, is that part of the problem that we really just aren't grappling with the true picture yet? I don't think we're grappling with it at all. Uh, we just saw the ridiculousness of uh, the Family Violence Legal Services National Secretariat uh, being defunded. And one of the key issues in addressing violence within uh, the Aboriginal community is understanding what the differences are and what the different approaches need to be in addressing this issue. I mean, if you go to, say, for example, I'm sure Hannah would agree with me, to small communities or remote communities, anonymity doesn't exist. They're, everyone's related, everyone knows uh, what's going on, and there is an absolute lack of account of, uh, of places to go to. There's, there's no housing, there's overcrowding, uh, there is extreme poverty, and these things feed into uh, being able to either leave a violent situation or have the dynamics change. Hannah, Linda mentioned there the National Family Violence Prevention and Legal Services Forum, which is basically the national voice for Indigenous women who are survivors of family violence. It's losing its funding in June at this stage. It represents something like, I think, 13 services across the country. Linda is obviously concerned about its defunding. Do you share that view? I, I think it's being done based on an evaluation by Charles Darwin University, which says that um, it's needed and that the, those grassroots organisations will in fact see a boost to their funding. Is there sort of a, a, a universal view about this? Um, no, I don't um, know if there's a universal view. I understand the funding went back to the actual services, but we certainly do need um, a peak body and it's very unclear as to why it funded, defunded. I don't agree with it. Many years ago in Australia, we were lobbying uh, for a national action plan and let, uh, Amnesty led the way with that call um, and it was an effective campaign. And uh, within that campaign, I called for and Amnesty supported a national task force of Aboriginal women experts to lead research and policy and directions uh, to address this violence against Indigenous women. The government didn't pick up on that, unfortunately. We're coming to the first term of the National Action Plan, and it's really important that we take on the advice of several UN treaty bodies now, including the Treaty Body on Race Discrimination, who reviewed Australia last, the UN Special Rapporteur on Indigenous People, the UN Special Rapporteur on Violence Against Women have all recommended to Australia, noting this very high level of violence against Indigenous women, and I can actually talk about statistically higher than um, those that were introduced. We have a study in West Australia showing Aboriginal mothers are more than 17 times more likely to be a victim of homicide than a non-Aboriginal mm. woman. So um, they have talked about a specific national action plan. This is what the government needs to do under our, in accordance with our important human rights obligation to protect uh, women's lives. The current um, action plan is expiring and it simply hasn't uh, been uh, adequate in terms of the um, nature and extent of violence against Indigenous women, including the fact that many Indigenous women experience a great level of uh, discrimination um, in the interface with the justice system. So how would you see then a standalone Indigenous National Action Plan improving the situation based on what's happening now? Well, I think um, this could be fleshed out through the, uh, the Senate inquiry that Linda's called for that I support. And, uh, you know, I think that we could also look at that amnesty recommendation and setting the scene about the National Task Force of Indigenous Women Experts. Uh, and I think it certainly will improve what we're seeing now because we are not putting our investment um, into areas that we should be to stopping the violence in the first place. So we urgently need to uh, increase our attention to early intervention and prevention. We don't want children witnessing violence growing up and perpetrating or becoming a victim themselves. And we simply haven't made those sort of healing and um, therapeutic and intervention, proper interventions into Aboriginal communities to support um, children, youth, um, women and men as well. 
We haven't had um, widespread community education campaigns and anti-violence campaigns in our community. And we certainly do need to uh, address and improve uh, the legal responses. We had an Aboriginal woman who went in to find details about how her mother died or give police concern, uh, information of concern about her suspicious uh, circumstances of death in Perth over Christmas and she was thrown into jail instead because she had a few unpaid fines. Mm. Uh, we actually have women, Aboriginal women who are mentally unwell, destabilised from so much violence against them when their family of Joyce Clark in Geraldton called for help to take her to a hospital. Um, a young policeman drew his gun and shot her dead. He's now charged with murder. So we need to look at, um, you know, racism against Aboriginal women because racism is a part of this violence too that's also um, killing our people. Some Aboriginal women have begged for help in hospitals and um, been denied any help at all. Miss Do, who had injuries in, in a Port Hedland cell, was denied all medical treatment. Um, she was a victim of violence and she was um, dying for, for a few thousand dollars of um, unpaid fines or perhaps but less. There are some very, very real answers. And um, I was involved a few years ago in a program called Tackling Violence where we actually used the local rugby league team as the champions against violence within the community. And it actually worked. It was really uh, a really innovative way of looking at a local level about what can be done. And the other thing, of course... Can, is sorry, that, can I go back to that, Linda? Because it's great to hear about things that actually work. Can you give us a sense of yep. what happened and what the results were that you say sure. proved that it worked? So it was a very small investment. Uh, as when I was in the, a minister in the New South Wales government, uh, I think there were in the end there were about thirty um, Aboriginal communities involved. You sponsored the local uh, rugby league football club. Uh, uncles, un uncles, fathers, cousins played in that in that club, and they all signed a contract that if they uh, cross the line in terms of their own behaviour and domestic violence, they were banned from playing. And the local police got involved, the local women's organisations, uh, the local government, and across the whole town, whether it was Burke or Wilcannia, they actually owned the problem and took responsibility for it. And the outcomes were amazing. There was an incredible uh, uh, inc incredible lowering of the DV rates. And we also used, uh, there were ads on TV, local TV, so it was about self-esteem, but it was also about men in that community taking the responsibility on, therefore the whole community saying, no, nah, this is not good enough, we can do better. And it was really effective. Hannah made the point, Linda, about potentially looking at a standalone national mm. Indigenous plan. Uh, there's certainly been a case mounted that domestic violence organisations in the mainstream don't understand necessarily the particular issues that face Absolutely. Indigenous families. Is that yeah. the real issue here? I think that that's uh, that's part of the, part of the issue is that uh, that a lot of um, Aboriginal women won't necessarily use a mainstream service because there isn't the understanding of history of culture of community dynamics of kinship dynamics and they're the, they're the things that are really important. Uh, one of the real concerns, Kathy and Hannah, I think, is that in some communities where it's predominantly an Aboriginal community, domestic violence has almost become normalised and young women don't necessarily recognise that if your boyfriend wants to see every text message that he's that you've received that day, that that's actually a form of abuse and a precursor to what, what might be um, what might be coming. So it really is also not about what government can do um, from some uh, remote place, whether it's Canberra, Sydney, Perth or wherever, is actually about what's happening in the local community. And I think there is a much more uh, important role that things like local government and local organisations would be more than willing to take on 
if the uh, if the support and the innovation was there. Hannah McGlade, there's currently work being done to finalise the Closing the Gap refresh and there's certainly been a push for justice targets to reduce rates of family violence and imprisonment. You, I know you're particularly interested in the treatment of women in the justice system um, in relation mm. to DV. Is that one way of really sort of putting a focus on it? Oh, look, I argued for justice targets, I think, um, possibly 10 years ago. I think that's absolutely critical. What we're seeing um, in regards to um, inequality is the gap is actually widening in two areas, and one of those is incarceration and the other is removal of Aboriginal children. And uh, they're both very serious and, and warrant a lot more attention than they have. I think sometimes, though, we're saying, you know, let's make this a target, another target, and we're just not. Um, improving um, barely anywhere, actually. So uh, there's a lot more um, that really does need to be done. We had a critical report uh, by the Australian Law Reform Commission um, a year and a half ago, um, Pathways to Justice, Reducing Indigenous Incarceration. This has been tabled in Parliament with no response from the current government. And uh, in West Australia, we have uh, a new bill for children and child protection. And as Aboriginal women, um, we are um, standing up and wanting um, the best responses uh, for our children. And we do want to see an increased inter um, attention to early intervention and prevention and healing and therapeutic responses. We've got to tilt um, you know, the funding too back um, in that direction because uh, we're just doing the patch-up job on the women in prison, the women in hospitals, the women whose deaths are being now dealt with by the police, the men being incarcerated. You know, this is the wrong way of going about it. So, uh, you know, we have to look at, um, you know, bringing the proper expertise on because uh, so far governments really haven't been listening to Aboriginal women who are experts in this area and there is a great deal we can do. Um, I, I just need to tell you all as well, we have launched the Indigenous Femicide International Case Study um, on the Deathscapes uh, Project, um, uh, which is um, an international research uh, project looking at Indigenous um, femicide and uh, women's voices and women's um, resistance and women's use of arts in highlighting what's actually happening. You mentioned, uh, you know, the need for sort of, well, I think Linda mentioned the need for really sort of drilling down to examples to sort of remind people about this is an issue around individuals, not statistics. And um, one of the cases, Hannah, that you talked about, which really I think um, has had a big impact on you, is um, the um, case of Jodie Gore in WA. She was sentenced to life imprisonment for uh, killing her former partner in 2016. And I think it's a, it's a particularly telling story, isn't it? Yes. And um, I, I was, um, it was a big case for me uh, last year and, and late year before that, because, um, you know, to find out just uh, by chance um, that an Aboriginal woman from the far north of the state in Kununurra was serving a murder sentence when she'd been a victim of, you know, severe domestic violence um, was really shocking. It flew in the face of, you know, what I knew the criminal justice system was supposed to be about. Um, so we had a um, campaign. I initiated a campaign with um, some really good people, um, Professor Starrant from UWA, a self-defence expert, and and others who came in to, um, you know, help Jody and to highlight her case. Her case went largely unreported at the time. Um, she's a woman who, like many Aboriginal women, had been beaten with weapons. So weapons are more likely to be used. Women are much higher risk of dying. Um, the um, former partner had um, experienced mental illness when he had been brought from that country down to Perth just for some minor offending. And he came home with a a mental illness, quite a severe one called schizophrenia. And Jodie was being relied on by um, mental health workers who come and go, transient people in the community to be his support person and make sure he got his medication. And he didn't always get his medication. So even though had their relationship had ended, she kept playing a um, sort of carer role mm. for him. But it was so shocking, the whole, whole legal system, every arm of it from the police to the prosecutor, to the non-Aboriginal woman judge, to the jury, 
you know, none of them wanted to look at, at all the violence that she'd experienced, including on the night where she feared for her life and defended herself. And, uh, you know, there was just no understanding of it. The judge actually made a comment at one point saying, since you separated, there had been no acts of violence, even though there were threats made to you. Well, actually, we found out that since um, this uh, relationship separation had happened, you know, it hadn't um, ended completely at all because Jody had been a carer and the court hadn't bothered or the prosecutor hadn't bothered to go to the local women's refuge and ask for Jody's file. And so we see records from after that date where Jody is fleeing uh, to the refuge to seek help. So it was, um, we highlighted this case with Annabelle Hennessy in the West Australia and uh, by the w end of week four, the Attorney General ha and the um, Prime Minister of West Australia, Mr McGowan, um, did an amazing thing. They um, actually released Jody mm. via a deed of mer a mercy, de mercy plea. What, yeah. what it goes to, though, is, as you say, this sort of systemic blindness. This morning I'm speaking with Linda Burney. She's the Shadow Minister for Indigenous Australians and Dr Hannah McGlade, a human rights lawyer and Noongar woman. We're on today's roundtable looking at the question of what to do in tackling the very high rates around Indigenous domestic violence. Linda, Linda, Bernie, you spoke publicly about your personal experience with domestic violence, uh, what, well, about five years ago now, but it's not an easy thing to do. And we know that many people, Indigenous and non-Indigenous, don't talk about it for a range of reasons. Are there specific factors at play for Indigenous women? And I'm, I'm thinking, and we've sort of, I think, touched on a little bit, I'm thinking about the fear of police and fear of losing yes. children. Yeah. There are some very specific issues that um, that have to be considered and I think the story that Hannah just told you um, about uh, the, the, the um, police process, the judicial process and it, there are many people involved in, uh, in domestic violence including how police and prosecutors and lawyers and so forth interact if they don't have an understanding of uh, the, the true story of Australia, if they don't have a, a cultural understanding of what they need to, to consider, then you're going to have perverse outcomes. Um, and that's a really important point. And, and Cathy, I felt very compelled to talk about my own experience uh, because I thought that it really needs to be made clear that domestic violence does not discriminate um, and that it can affect uh, affect anyone and of course when we talk about uh, domestic violence it needs to be understood and I'm so pleased that you've you've made the point uh, it's not just the women that, that are murdered it's the it's the intergenerational trauma it's what your children are left with it's what you are left with it's also very much what um, uh, what 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 the effect is over a lifetime it's um, and what, what the different nature of, of what abuse can be, and it can be financial. Some of the women I've spoken to that are deeply affected are women that have been um, just terrorised. They haven't been beaten up, but they've been terrorised and isolated. And those things are particularly significant, particularly isolation and lack of family support and contact for First Nations women. And so, I mean, we've only got a few minutes now, or a couple of minutes before we go to the news. But just to, to finish up, Linda, on that question then around your calls for a Senate inquiry, has there been any progress? I know you made that, I think, in de late December. There has been absolutely no progress. Um, and it just seems to me that uh, that we need to re renew that call, particularly in light of the International Women's Day today, we had the vigil in Parliament House last week for Hannah Clark and, and her children and other women that have uh, that have lived in terror actually and it just it just is the intergenerational trauma and the trauma and the effect of a lifetime um, for for women in particular that uh, that live with this and how prevalent it is in Australia. I, it's just remarkable to me that uh, that it's not seen as the, with the urgency that it needs to be seen as. Mm. Hannah, we've got about 30 seconds. Just some final observations from you, please. 
Well, I think we're at the point where we need a, a national collective day of action for murdered and missing Indigenous women and girls. The situation for Aboriginal women is um, the most serious um, situation, I believe, in terms of human rights in this country. And what we're seeing um, uh, this wider, the family court and the treatment of uh, women with children, um, this is um, not placing Australia in any good light at all. It's a very salient call on this International Women's Day. Thank you both for joining us this morning. Thanks, Kathy. Thank you very much. Linda Burney is the Shadow Minister for Indigenous Australians and Dr Hannah McGlade is a human rights lawyer and senior Indigenous research fellow at Curtin University in WA.